full of joy, delighting in God's goodness to you this morning, grateful for his strengthening in this past week, eager to sing his praises and to listen to his word as you meet with his people. Uh, praise God if that's you this morning. But perhaps this morning you have just barely dragged yourself to church. And to be honest, as you sit there at the moment, you kind of wish you hadn't. It's been a joy in the past, but perhaps now it feels a bit like a duty as life weighs heavy on you and you wonder if the whole thing is worth it. If that's you, well, well done for making it this far. And I think you'll understand where the psalmist is coming from in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so, why is it so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taught me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Starts off like a psalm of the keen, doesn't it? My soul thirsts for God, but it soon becomes clear that actually at the moment, the psalmist just feels empty. He remembers times in the past when he went to the house of God full of praise and joy, but now he is downcast. And you hear that phrase several times, don't you? And yet he is there. Remembering what has gone before, he vows to praise, not because he feels like it, but because he knows what God is like. He's experienced that goodness, although right now he feels very adrift. And it's a flip-flop battle in his mind, isn't it? It is very cool. One moment, one moment he declares in verse 8, By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. And the next moment he says, verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Walking with God in a broken world is difficult. Walking with God in a broken world is difficult. It's not a smooth path. And there are times when God can feel very distant and all we have are questions. And the psalmist is real about them. But still he returns with a call to himself at the end to put his hope in God. Because where else can he turn? And actually where else would he want to turn? So where else can you and I turn? And where else would you and I want to turn? But remember who he is. He is the great saviour. He is the promise keeping God who rescues his people. So if you've dragged yourself to church this morning, well done. Now is the time to be reminded of who it is we come to, the one who is our good, gracious, and rescuing king. Let's pray together as we begin. Father God, we thank you that you don't expect us to come all sorted out, that you welcome us to come in the midst of our joys and in the midst of our struggles and our grief and our pain. And so we pray that as we come to you again once, this, once again this morning, we pray that you would help us to help one another to see once again the beauty of who you are, the fact that you are trustworthy in all things, the one who is rich in love and whose heart is kind. Help us and meet with us today, we pray, from the youngest to the oldest. Remind us of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand, if you're able, to sing our first song, which reminds us and reminds our souls to praise him the one who is rich in love and whose heart is kind. If you're able to stand, let's sing together.
praise of this great God, the one who is faithful to us in all circumstances, through all seasons of life. So we praise him.
so as we remember God's faithfulness in the past and we look forward to his faithfulness in the future, so we seek to trust him, the one who is our great shepherd. Part of how we display our trust in our gracious Lord Jesus is by bringing uh, one another and ourselves before him uh, in prayer. And so Anne is going to come and lead us in some prayers now. Thanks, Anne. Let's all pray together. Psalm 8, verses 3 to 4 reads, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. In this psalm, as David looks up at the night sky, he's amazed at God's greatness. God made the moon and all the stars in the vastness of the night sky. And yet David knows that our wonderful creator God is deeply concerned about every man, woman and child that he created in his image. God loves his children. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we all gather together this morning to worship you, whether in our church building or online, you know each one of us each one of us is precious to you and is loved by you we're sorry heavenly father for those times when we let you down and don't live as your children should forgive us we pray for those times even in this last week when we've done said or thought things that have made you sad Thank you for your patience with us and for the forgiveness we can know because of the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Thank you that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us to live for you every day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many good things you've given us to enjoy. Help us not to take them for granted. Thank you that you have placed us together on life's journey to help and to encourage one another, to share the joys and the sorrows that we all experience from time to time. No matter what each day brings, Heavenly Father, we know that you are always with us and that you tell us not to be afraid because you will help us. Sometimes we find our circumstances very difficult and the world may seem a dark place, but we thank you that often in ways we least expect, you shine your light into that darkness and remind us that you are with us. This morning, we bring before you those who are finding life difficult for whatever reason just now. At the start of a new school year, it may be hard to get used to a new situation at school, in a new class, at home or at work. It may be working through relationship or friendship difficulties. It may be suffering loss. It may be feeling lonely. It may be coping with pain day by day or with the suffering and life-changing effects of illness. We want to pray this morning particularly for Jean and Michael, for Roger and Sheila, for Sue Marsh, for those that are known only to some of us and for those that are known only to themselves and to you. May we all know your loving presence. May we know <clears throat> your peace and unfailing tenderness day by day as you hold each one of us in your everlasting arms. We pray too for the countries of our world struggling with the awfulness of war. We think especially of Ukraine and for those struggling with the devastating effects of natural disaster, especially thinking today of Morocco in the aftermath of the earthquake there. Thank you, Father, that in the midst of so much that we find so hard to understand, we can trust to you the world that you have made and that in this world, you are building your church. As your church here and those of us serving you around the world, may we know our Lord Jesus better today and may we be both bold and confident in making him known to others, not in our own strength, but in yours, trusting you, our loving Heavenly Father, for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Anne. In our next song, we are going to trust the God who is faithful to his promises and we're going to remind ourselves of who he is, the firm foundation that we build on, what we believe, uh, our firm foundations in the midst of what is often a turbulent world. Let's stand if we're able. <laughs>
rocks on which we build our lives. This is who God is. He is our great rescuer, the one who came to save us, the one who is always faithful, the one who is always with us. And there are actions to go along with this one. Have I got some assistance to come and help me? Excellent. We're going to sing and we're going to do actions as we remind ourselves by what we say and by what we do of the goodness of God and his presence always with us. Well done, girls. I'll move this way. We're ready. Well done, that was brilliant, kids. Well done. Go and take a seat. Everyone else can take a seat too. And let me tell you about a few things coming up uh, this coming week or next, the next coming week or two. Uh, firstly, if you're a church member, do uh, be there on Tuesday. Uh, be here on Tuesday evening if you're able to be at 8 o'clock. There's also uh, the usual Zoom option if you can't make it uh, uh, here. So it'd be good to be uh, here for that. Next Sunday sees the beginning of our next uh, Forum at Five series. We're doing the Real Change course where we think about how God begins to change us by his spirit and how we work in conjunction with him in doing that. It's a really excellent opportunity to, to think through how we become more like the Lord Jesus and how we can help one another to do that too. If you're not often uh, along at a Forum at Five series, do give this one a try. It's a great opportunity to think through those things. That begins uh, next week uh, at five o'clock, as you can tell by the title. Um, then also next weekend, uh, this is slightly late notice, um, something a bit different. The local residents association have asked us about showing a film uh, here for the local community. So we've agreed to, to host that uh, event as an opportunity for us to continue to engage with those around, a bit like we did at the family uh, fun day, and we do at things like our board games and pizza uh, evening. So that will be next Saturday afternoon. And a 2.30 start for the film. It'll be a PG film, uh, so suitable uh, for children. It'd be great to have uh, plenty of us uh, to come along to mix with folk from our lo local community. And we'd also love to have a few who would be able to help just with, with hosting the event, so welcoming people in uh, and that kind of thing as we try to serve those around and build relationships. If you want to know more about that, do come and talk to me afterwards. That's next uh, Saturday. And then the following Saturday is our next ball games and pizza night, uh, Saturday the 23rd. Uh, if you're able to be along at that, uh, do come along. That would be uh, great. Uh, it's time now for the children to head uh, to their groups uh, out through the, the back door. And while they uh, do that, why don't you take the opportunity to say good morning to someone that you haven't said good morning to yet? Or someone you have already said good morning to? I'm easy. Now but may also be the opportunity in true Rugby World Cup fashion to take a water break. If you do need something to drink, uh, over in the back corner there are some uh, water and glasses.
As we uh, prepare to listen to God's word together this morning, uh, in this next song, we're going to remind ourselves once more of who it is that we come to listen to, the one who is utterly reliable in all circumstances, the one who is working out history according to his purposes, and the one whose purposes are for our good, because he is the one who is our rock and our redeemer. So if you're able, do stand and we sing together. Father God, we thank you that you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. And so please show us more of yourself this morning as we look to your word. Show us more of your great plan for history, your great plan for us, that we might be excited once more at your goodness towards us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you please take a seat? <coughs> so if I begin this morning with these words, I am your father, I wonder what it leaves you thinking. Some of you will be thinking, he's obviously got a bit of sunstroke. Others will be thinking, no, you're not. I'm very glad for that. And at least one of you may be thinking, oh, no, Dad, what now? But others will be thinking, Star Wars. And when I mention that, a few more of you may get the connection, but others will still be all at sea and wondering what on earth I'm talking about. Now, any self-respecting Star Wars fan could probably wax lyrical for a number of minutes about the significance of that one line in the whole storyline of the Star Wars universe. They might even be keen to come and show you the scene itself. But if you've never seen Star Wars, if you don't know anything about the big story that it's telling, you will still have no clue about the significance of that one line and that one scene. 
We're beginning a four-part series today looking at the big storyline of the Bible. And there are a number of good reasons for doing that. Let me give you just two. One is that grasping that big storyline of how the whole Bible fits together will then help us to make sense of the individual passages that we read, particularly some of those where we wonder quite how they fit in with the whole story. But it will also help us to see the full significance of, of the bigger events. They are actually given greater weight as we see how they fit into the big storyline. We see more of how they are significant, a bit like Darth Vader's revelation that he is Luke Skywalker's father. Oops, spoiler alert. And secondly then, as we begin to look at that big overarching storyline of the Bible, we can begin to see how that makes sense of the world and of ourselves and of God. And we're going to see that then how that begins to shape our expectations and our confidence and our outlook on life. So if you want a rough roadmap of where we're going over the next few weeks, here it is. Today, we're going to be thinking about the themes of creation and fall and promise. And that will help us to know our world. And then by way of application, we're going to consider how that shapes our expectations of life. In session two next week, we'll think about the exodus and the law and the temple and how that helps us to know ourselves. And then in application, we'll think about how we are therefore to view ourselves and those around us and everyone else. What does the big Bible storyline tell us about humanity? Then in session three, we'll think about the promised Messiah, the dying king and the living Lord and how that helps us to know God himself. And we'll consider the centrality of his grace and the wonder of his kindness towards humanity and how that begins to shape everything else that we do. And then in session four, as we finish, we'll think about the Holy Spirit's presence and his work now and then glory and restoration still to come. And how, help, how that helps us to know the big story that God is writing that we fit into. And we'll try and tie all the ends together and see how confident we can be that God has it all in hand. And so therefore how we're to live in response. So that's hopefully where we're going over the next few weeks. But we're going to start at the very beginning, because rumour has it, that's a very good place to start. So there's no easier passage for you to find uh, in the Bible, because it's the first passage in the Bible, it's Genesis chapter 1. And it begins like this. In the beginning, God. Uh, and we're going to pause there. Uh, and don't worry if you're thinking this is going to take an awfully long time to get through the whole Bible storyline if we pause every four words, we're not going to do that. But it is important for us to pause there. Because although we're going to be focusing on the theme of knowing God in, in session three, actually we begin with him. The whole storyline begins with him. This whole thing is his story that he is writing in history and that he is shaping. So what we're going to see as we work through this is not actually the story of humanity at all. We are not the stars of the show. It's not all about us. Actually, as we're going to see in a few minutes' time, it's that attitude which is the fundamental problem that this whole book will be addressing. And in session two, we're going to concentrate more on getting a proper view of ourselves, of, of humanity. No, this is God's story that we're looking at. It's actually all about him. The Bible, first and foremost, shows us who he is. It's a book about a person, not simply a book about a bunch of events. It's not a, it's not a handbook on how to live life. It's not a collection of, a, of wise words to tell you how to make the best of life. It's about a person. Actually, even more than that, it's a person's word about himself. It's God himself who speaks to us as we read the Bible. He shows us himself in this book. And so we begin with him. The starting point for all our thinking, for all our understanding of everything must begin with God and who he is. He is the one who is the great I am and everything else is secondary. And so before we go any further, before we get past those first four words of the Bible, there's application here to our thinking, isn't there? 
a challenge, actually, to our view of the world and of ourselves. Is God my starting point for how I think and act? Does he shape my understanding of reality? See, I can easily come to the Bible with my questions that I want answers because I think I know what is important for me to know. Or I can easily come to the Bible to judge what it is saying against the common wisdom of the world or what I think must be true because I think I know what is right and proper. But if God is there and if he speaks, then that must be the starting point, mustn't it? Because he is God and we are not. We begin with him because he begins everything else. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what a world he's made. What a world he's made. Have a listen to just some of the description here in Genesis chapter 1. We're picking up at verse 11. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with, the, with which the water teems, and the moves about in it according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. <clears throat> and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Let me just draw your attention briefly to a couple of things there. Firstly, did you notice how the writer makes great play of the sheer diversity of the world and of the creativity, therefore, that goes into making it? Did you hear that repeated phrase, according to their kinds, describing plants and birds and animals and creatures of the sea? Well, no wonder people are caught up with the wonder of science and how we long to explore and to understand and to investigate this beautiful world that we have. No wonder they escaped for quite so many nature programs again and again. It was made by God to be enjoyed, and he could see all of it was good. That's another repeated refrain in those verses, isn't it? A good God has created a good creation. And then the culmination of it all, he creates humanity, men and women in his image, given dignity and value and status. We'll think more about that next week, more spoilers. And then that final summary, it is very good. And for a moment, we're left to bask in the beauty of this scene that God has made. A creation teeming with life and, and full of splendour, with relationship at its very heart as Adam and Eve are united together, free from shame or barriers of any kind, enjoying together the, the presence and the blessing of the God who made them. But that wonderful picture lasts a mere two chapters in the Bible. Before along comes Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafted than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat tree from the fruit, from the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. 
you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. But God knows that when you eat it from, from it, your eyes will you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles from you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Well, once again, let me draw your attention to a few things. Firstly, did you see where Satan began in undermining the whole thing? He questioned the character of God, didn't he? Just as the, the Bible storyline, and indeed all of reality, finds its beginning in God and who he is, in the beginning God, so the unravelling of it all finds its beginning in the twisting of God and who he is and what he's like. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And of course he didn't. And the woman acknowledges that. But then she says they weren't supposed to touch it either. He'd never said that at all. God actually had explicitly given them permission to eat from any tree they liked, save one. So the devil has already made God out to be restrictive and ungenerous. Do you see where he goes from there? Don't you see what God is doing to you? Says the devil. He's looking to keep you down. He's looking to restrict your freedom. He's, he's trying to prevent you from fulfilling your great potential. Doesn't that sound familiar in many people's perspective of God today? What's God like? He's fairly restrictive, isn't he? He wants to crush you, to keep you in a box. No, says the devil, you're made for more than this. Take and eat. Just as an aside here, a bit of a spoiler as well. Have you ever noticed that at the Last Supper, when he introduces the meal to remember the great rescue of humanity, Jesus told his disciples to take and eat? And actually, it's there that we see the true character of God, isn't it? The one who is self-giving who is generous, who is merciful, who is full of grace, who brings freedom to guilty people in contrast to the devil's lies about it. But that's for session three, more spoilers. But with this rebellion in Genesis chapter three, so much that is good is lost, isn't it? We end up with fractured relationships with one another leading to mutual blame and suspicion. There's the beginnings of pain and struggle and toil and frustration. Creation itself is marred and damaged, no longer simply a thing of beauty to be enjoyed, but often now an obstacle to be overcome, thorns and thistles. And worst of all, humanity is put out of the presence of God. And so the world is no longer what it should be. It is a broken world. And it's broken because humanity has rejected the source of all goodness, the creator himself. And there are consequences. 
There are terrible consequences of that rejection. And so the story that follows, if you keep reading through the next couple of chapters of, of Genesis, is not a pretty one. The first murder appears on the scene frighteningly quickly. And before you know it, you've reached the point of Noah and the flood in Genesis chapter 6 and the, the wickedness of the world that has reached awful heights, leaving God grieving at what he says, at what he sees. And so from, from looking at his creation with humanity made in the image of God at the centre of it and declaring it to be very good, now the Lord looks at the world and he's grieved. And then a couple of chapters later in chapter 11, we see that problem writ large once more. Humanity's desire to be supreme, to replace God, is demonstrated at the Tower of Babel. The tower reaching to the heavens to show how magnificent we are. A declaration of humanity's supremacy and glory. And instead it brings further judgment from God in the scattering of the peoples and the confusion of their life. And yet, thank goodness the story doesn't finish in Genesis chapter 11. Or in Genesis chapter 3 for that matter. In fact, actually, it's just a beginning. But more on that in a minute. First, let's just pause at this point to see, to consider what this means for our understanding of our world. And it is this, as we've already said, that this world is beautiful, yet broken. It is both those two things at the same time. So there remains so much to be enjoyed in our world. We don't live in some kind of post-apocalyptic wasteland, so beloved of movie makers. We still live in a world of seemingly infinite variety with, with sights and sounds and smells and tastes and touch to enjoy. So we're going to sing of, of summer and winter and springtime and harvest, all demonstrations of the, of the faithfulness of God, all evidence of his goodness in creating this world. So we can and should delight in the world he's made. We, we can and should investigate and explore it. We should marvel at its riches and its wonder. We can and we should stop and smell the roses. Pause to enjoy the sights and sounds of all that is around us. Actually, if we fail to do that, we fail to appreciate the creator who made it to be enjoyed. And we can, therefore, and we should care for this world that God has created. Tending and caring for his creation was the first commission God gave humanity. And our failure to do so and our neglect of it going forward speaks of our rebellion against our creator. And there remains, too, the delight of human relationships, of people to walk with and talk with and work with and play with. And actually, God himself is far from completely absent in this world. It was he who clothed Adam and Eve, even as they are removed from the garden, and there is so much more still to come from him. So, brothers and sisters, there is great joy to be had in this world. There is much common grace to be experienced by all people. God remains kind and generous in all that he's given. And yet, too, this world is broken. And relationships break down. And work can be hard and draining. And pain is real. And grief hurts. And death brings separation. And the world doesn't quite work right. And in fact, at times we are well aware that it is a long, long, long way from being what it should be. We were thinking about that in a few more detail, a bit more detail a few weeks ago, weren't we, as we considered the suffering, the, the subject of suffering and the openings that it gives for the gospel. And you might remember we saw there that it is precisely this big Bible storyline of a beautiful but broken world which fits with the reality of what we see and experience day by day. See, the Bible storyline helps us to understand our world, and so that in turn needs to shape our expectations. That this world will bring both joy and frustration, and we should not be surprised at either. We should not be surprised at the struggles we may encounter, and the sufferings we may experience, and the tears we may shed. Pain's real, and the Bible does nothing to dismiss it as either irrelevant or inconsequential. Indeed, actually, the Bible makes much of that struggle to live. It calls it a problem. It points to, the, to that brokenness. 
And the Bible calls on us to ask the question, why? Not, why is this particular thing happening to me? Because that's the question that we often ask, isn't it? But there are rarely specific answers to that. And actually, even if there were, the pain would still be real, wouldn't it? No, rather, the Bible storyline continues, uh, and we frequently come across pain and distress and suffering and struggle in the events that unfold. And so it invites that question, why is this not what it should be? And the answer takes us back to Genesis chapter 3. And it urges us to long for and to look for rescue, for something better. But just as we should not be surprised at struggles, so we also should enjoy the delights of the world that God has made and express the gratitude that is due to him for his common grace, as Anne was doing earlier on in her prayers. But I suspect we're often slow to do that, aren't we? Slow to appreciate the good things, slow to be thankful. We tend to take them as a matter of right rather than to receive them as a gracious gift from God. But God made a good world for us to enjoy, and it honours him when we do so, and the only proper response is thanks and praise. Do you make that a regular part of your day? To be thankful for the good things God has given? Even amidst the reality of pain. But we can't leave our Bible storyline there at the end of Genesis chapter 11, because it's only just started. And the reason that it's only just started, rather than being wrapped up after Adam and Eve's sin, or the wickedness of Noah's time, or the arrogance of Babel, is because of the God who began it all. We come back to him once again, because right from the start, we hear promises of rescue. Even within the curse of Genesis 3 itself, did you notice there was the promise of the rescuer? Addressed to the serpent, to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God promises there will one day come a son of Eve who will crush Satan once and for all. So even from this point, even from so early on in the story, the story of a broken world and of rebellious humanity, even from that point, it is not hopeless. Because God is not finished yet. Because of the kind of God that he is. And so even as the story then continues over those following chapters and we see more of the wickedness of humanity, so also we see more of the graciousness and mercy of God. Cain is shown mercy. Noah is rescued from the flood. And the rainbow appears as a promise that God will not wipe humanity out. And then even in the aftermath of humanity's arrogance and pretensions to be like God as they're displayed again at Babel, we're introduced to a new family line and a man at the end of that family line. Not a remarkable man by any stretch of the imagination, just an ordinary man, and actually one who in the following chapter will soon show that he has feet of clay. But he's a man to whom a promise is made in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who curse you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And here comes a key point in this Bible storyline, in this promise to Abraham. See, Adam and Eve, you remember, were told to multiply and to fill the earth. Now God promises to Abraham he will make him into a great nation. Adam and Eve were removed from God's place, his garden. And now God promises Abraham that he will give him a new land, a new place to dwell. Adam and Eve were removed from God's presence. And now God promises that he himself will show Abraham, Abraham this land. And Adam and Eve have brought a curse on all humanity by their rejection of God. And now God promises that through Abraham, he will bless all the nations. All the nations. All those that he's just scattered at Babel because they persist in rebelling against him. They persist in wanting to be God themselves. And yet God promises to bless. 
God promises to bless. He promises to reverse the curse, to make things right. He promises to rescue rebellious sinners for himself. He promises good news. Good news. That's the heart of the big story of the Bible. It's actually God himself and who he is and therefore what he does. All that he will do for the people that he's made. And that's what we're going to see in the next couple of weeks. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you that we can address you as such. We thank you that you are abundantly full of grace and mercy. We thank you that you show your generosity in this beautiful world that you've made for us to enjoy. We thank you that you show your grace and mercy in not wiping us out as we continue to rebel against you. We thank you supremely that you show your grace and mercy in the promise of that saviour who one day will crush the evil one. We thank you for a hope and a future that we have in the Lord Jesus. And so we pray that you'd help us in the light of this big story that you are writing to view our world rightly, to delight in its goodness and to enjoy it, to recognise its brokenness and to long for something more. And most of all, to fix our eyes on you, the one who made it and the one who rescues us, even though we persist in turning away. So as we see more of you, help us to be those who sing your praises and trust you for all that's to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to sing a song which reminds us of the wonder of the creation that God has made and sings his praises, but then moves on to remember the wonder of the rescue that he has brought in the Lord Jesus and the wonder of hope still to come. Spoiler alert, that's where the story's going. If you're able, do stand and let's sing together.
Monday School are not quite finished yet, so you have a couple of minutes to uh, chat with those around you, parents of the younger group. You don't have to rush straight through to get them. Um, when the doors open, you'll know it's time to go and get them. Let's pray together as we finish. Lord God, you are indeed great. You are great in terms of the majesty and the glory of the creation that you have made that reflects something of your creativity and beauty. But you are great too in the wonderful rescue that you have brought and in the promises that you make to keep us right through to the end. So please help us as we seek to trust you in whatever you have for us in the week ahead, knowing what you are like, your goodness and your kindness towards us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take care. Thank you.